Without further ado, it's going to be exciting today. We're going to have a great message ministered to us today uh, from our vice president, Dave Yarn. So would you welcome Dave as he comes to minister this morning? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Well, I think today's word is an important word. So, uh, Lord, we ask that we'd have hearing ears. Hearing ears and obeying hearts. Amen. Uh, we'd have the, the grace of God over us to hear and obey. And uh, I just do want to make a comment about Chris. Uh, a number of people have asked me my opinion about the transition here. And, and I'll tell you, I couldn't be happier. Uh, I think Rick has really done a great job in selecting his successor. But it's produced a stronger team than ever before. And um, I'm really excited. So behind the scenes... Well, the, the message today is um, how to never be dry again. Now, there's a reason, and if you'll stay with me to the end, there's a reason this message is vitally important, how to never be dry again. We remember uh, the story of the virgins and those that ran out of oil at precisely the wrong time were in a position where they couldn't fulfill their destiny. So the keys, the four keys, and again, stay with me to the end. I believe this is going to be important. And the first key I want to talk about is toxic hunger. And I first heard this phrase uh, from uh, Dr. Michael Brown. Dr. Brown, I don't know if you saw his physical transformation. The first time I saw him after he went on this diet, I honestly thought he had cancer or something. He, he was just so thin. And, and I began to talk with him, and he, was, he introduced this concept to me. He said, Dave, what had happened in his life was that he had um, been eating and gone into a physical toxic hunger. So physical toxic hunger is when we're eating and we're consuming food, but it lacks the vital nutrients. Our, so our average diet uh, doesn't come from the hand of God like it is. Now listen, I'm not scolding you. Listen, you know, I, I need the, this word myself. This isn't a word about diet. There's an analogy here that's really critically important. So what can happen is false hunger arises regardless of the amount of food you're eating because you're lacking these nutrients and it's not about caloric intake. Similarly, let's talk about spiritual toxic hunger. It exists when we go without anointed teaching and true spiritual connection. Can you hear me on this one? You need a direct touch from God and you can't replace it by more and more activity where you're running yourself out, going to every meeting or doing that. That stuff's important, but you can get spiritual toxic hunger. You come to the end of the week and you said, oh man, I went to all this stuff and I did all these things, but I'm empty. I'm dry inside. I don't feel the vine life of Christ. You say, Dave, this is impossible. Well, look at the Pharisees. In John, it says, you search the scriptures because you think you're going to find life, but they missed Christ himself. Can, I mean, it's, it's just mind-boggling to think of it. Thinking, think about being from the day they were born. They had an exacting study of the scriptures, wearing themselves out, but not able to see the move of God when it came, God himself in the flesh. Spiritual toxic hunger. Now, I, I get it, you know, um, there were times in my life in the past uh, you know, when I had uh, pastored a church and, uh, you know, really grown the church and I know the Lord was moving me on and I, I turned it over to my uh, executive uh, assistant and, you know, I went through this period where like, I'm, I'm not sure what life is going to look like, Lord. And I, you know, and it sent me in a little bit of a tailspin. And I'll tell you that my spiritual life consisted of, you know, 
small prayers in the morning and, and going to a service here and there and just, you know, I, I was disoriented and I, I wouldn't feel, but what I missed the most was this connection with God. This, this true sensation of connection. There's a reason that this is more important than you think in this day. There's a reason that this is vital for us. The second key is continually studying the fundamentals. You've heard Rick say this over and over again. Uh, Chris has mentioned this. You know, Chris and I were talking the other day and uh, what an incredible young leader in the body of Christ, but he's got a solid message, a foundational message, a foundational doctrine. Does that make sense? It, it, it's, he, he's not looking for sensationalism or fad. He's, he's preaching a solid mes message. And there's a reason that this can keep you out of a state where you're lacking that vibrant vine life of the gospel. So let's just review these and talk about them again. But as a principle... Somebody, just make it a point in your, your, your daily life, your routine. I'm going to continually, Dave, study the fundamentals of Christ until the day he calls me home. I'm going to continually go over it. Now, now, it's your responsibility. You know, Rick can't do it. Tom can't do it. I can't do it. You have to do this. But studying the, found, the fundamentals and the foundations, first of all, that Christ walked the earth and he was holy God and holy man. Somebody amen in your heart back there. This is so important because he didn't call on his celestial power to live a sinless life. He did it in such a way as to show us that this type of life that Christ walked on the earth is available to someone as small and insignificant as me, as you, that he did this in the form of man, holy man and holy God. He lived a sinless life. Yes, he was faced with temptations. I imagine if we knew the half of it, we would say he was filled with temptations we couldn't even imagine. I mean, from the hunger, the affliction, the pain, and all the time the devil saying, if you will just compromise, I will give you the biggest church in the world. I'll give you uh, more authority, more power, because this was the attack of the enemy on his mind. You remember that? Said Satan took him up to a pinnacle and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, Jesus, all you need to do is just short circuit this process of the cross and all these things that you're after will be yours. Which of us could have denied that kind of a temptation? He lived a sinless life. He suffered a terrible death to ransom us from destruction, number one. Paying a great price for our redemption, number two. But purchasing for us glorious riches. Go ahead and turn to someone and say, he, he purchased glorious riches for me. Because now that you said that, you're obligated to make sure that you procure all of those glorious riches in your life on a daily basis. Imagine the price that Christ prayed, paid for my mental health, for the breaking of anxiety in my life, for physical health, for uh, prosperous living. These things didn't come uh, at, uh, without a cost, it came at a terrible price. And can you imagine him paying that price and me just leaving these things on the counter on a daily basis and never ex accessing them, never pulling them down by faith, all these things that Christ purchased for me? Now remember, we're still in the message, how to never be dry again. I don't know if it's just the message, but I'm really dry.
I want to learn that trick that Bill Johnson does. He can open it with one hand and drink from it and put the cap back on. Some skill that brother has. Christ resurrected, freeing us from the bond of death. You have eternal life right now. I was uh, listening to a story. Uh, one of the elders from uh, Paul Young E. Cho's church died. An incredible circumstance. And uh, back in those days, they didn't have funeral homes. They were preparing the body uh, to be put in the ground. And three days later, they were just getting ready to shut the casket. And he jumped back up to life. And everybody ran out of the room. And he told them to come back in. And uh, uh, Cho tells the story. He interviewed him. But one of the things he said is that as he left his body before he was resurrected, so he's out of his body for a couple of days. When he left his body, he was fully conscious, fully alive. He was with angels. But as he was beginning to leave, he looked down and he saw his mortal body. And he was so disturbed and concerned, he turned to one of the angels. He said, this is, you know, my mortal body. He didn't know what to do. And the angel said, it's just a husk. That's the term he used. It's just a husk. Don't worry about that. This is a husk. Yeah, it's important we take care of it, but the gold is inside. The gold is inside, and you know Christ purchased that for us, the primary source of spiritual connection to God was paid for. And lastly, the, the plight of those that die without Christ in his atonement. You know, we don't talk about this much, but imagine how on fire and compelled we would be instead of looking at people that we feel are antagonistic to the gospel, those on TV and those in politics and those people that are peddling lies and hate, instead of seeing them as our enemy, we'd see them as poor, pitiful souls that are, that are facing an eternity without the mercy and atonement of Christ. It would compel us into another direction. It would, it would keep us up at night if we could truly see and believe this. It would change our outlook on how we see those that are antagonistic to us and to our faith. So we're still on this topic, how to never be dry again. Come on, I want it. I, I can't put my finger on how to exactly to describe it to you, but when the vine life of Christ is flowing in me and there's that connection with him and my, my, the Bible comes alive to me, there's, there's so much that goes on. That's what I'm talking about. The third key is you have to be a person of action. I love the scripture, it says Jesus suffered outside of the city, so let us go to him. You got to get up, and you got to go to him. As much, I mean, if is one of those things that like if I were God, I might do it where you just stay in your bedroom or wherever you are, and then God will come to you, and, but there's a sense that as we engage in the gospel, isn't it amazing the word gospel has go in it? As we engage in the gospel, in that fray, in that thin place between the devil and God and eternity and the earth, when we're there, we feel his anointing. We, we sense his presence. We're not dry again when we're engaging in his uh, place. I had a chance to talk with Julianne. Julianne's a New Yorker, and we both spent time in Manhattan. I was relating to her a story of working with uh, uh, the Upper Room in Midtown Manhattan, right across from the Port Authority. The Port Authority is in Times Square, and it's where all the buses come in, and it's just a, it was a really bleak place back in the 80s. I mean, just prostitutes that were yellow with jaundice and uh, crackheads. I mean, you know, this thing, like literally, I would see people and I didn't know they'd make it through the night. And in that place, um, they had set up a, a rescue shelter. You could get a cup of soup and stuff like that. You could hear the power of God. 
But I'll tell you, more than any church I've ever been, more than any cathedral, more than any anointed speaking, I sense the power of God crawling up in those little shanties and telling people about Christ and trying to pull them in. Why is that? Because Christ is there. These are his people. He's begging us to come and help him. All the while we're, you know, we can be just tucking ourselves away. I think it's important, don't get me wrong, we're tucking ourselves away, we wanna hear from God. Can you imagine, he, and he's yelling to us, will you come and help me with this dying world? Will you just do anything, just come and be a part? I remember the most spectacular miracle I ever saw in my life uh, was late at night, I was in this hospital and a guy was on a breathing machine, he had a massive heart attack and I, man, I didn't feel like I had any faith at all and uh, the Lord said he's got faith to be healed. So all I knew to do, I took out my Bible and I went through James and I talked to him about the elders prayer of faith and how he'd be raised up, I had no faith. I mean little, you know, I mean enough to do it. I put oil on my hand, laid it on him. He was completely healed. He was completely healed. Well, don't clap too much because here's what happened. I'm like, Rick, I thought I'm gonna go into the ministry now like this. I'm gonna send out pledge cards and go around and you know, I'm feeling all this thing and the Lord stopped me and he said, I would have used anybody. I just needed somebody to stand in this gap, reach their hand to heaven and touch him. I wanted to heal this guy so bad. And I just happened to stumble upon this thing. Does that make sense? Now I'll take it, but I think that's, the, I think that's where we are. I think that God is so desperate for souls to come outside of the city outside of the camp and to be used by him that he'll use someone like me or someone that just happens to be coming by. It's like a lightning rod. You're not producing the lightning. You just happen to raise your hand to God and bam, he's gonna use you to do something. Come on, give the Lord a hand on that one, yeah. Be a person of action. I want to give you some keys to action. Um, I've thought about this, I've wrote about this, I've read about this, I've spent a lifetime, I think, looking at what makes people successful and effective, and I just want to give you a couple of keys to action. The very, um, how do I want to say it? Uh, uh, exacting things you can use in your everyday life. First of all, Focus on movement, not the destination. The, you know, the, the road to your destiny is one step at a time. I remember when I was first thinking about working in Africa and, uh, you know, all the people that were going to be changed and everything that was going to go on, and, and thank the Lord I've had a chance to do that. I mean, thousands of lives have been changed through efforts that I've had a privilege of being a part of in Africa. I mean, I can see the people and tell you all the stories, but it came down to the first day, the Lord's like, you don't have a passport. I'm like, well, how do you get a passport? But I'd never had one before. Now this might sound small to you, and maybe if you came across a younger Dave Yarns, looking to get a passport, you would say, he's, he's not gonna amount to anything. Well, you still might say that, but, but at least for me, you couldn't see that that thing was the first step in a powerful journey in my life. Don't expect people to see your movement forward. They, they can't see the end. They can't see the destination. God has given that to you, but focus on movement. What can I do to move forward? I want to write that book. What can you do to move forward? What can I do? Who can I talk with? What can I do? Focus on movement, not the destination. Number two, compare yourself when you're taking action to who you were yesterday, not someone else today. <clears throat> I find especially with, with women, 
Um, ladies, this is, this is not, because uh, I feel like I'm the patron saint of empowering women. I really do. Because I've, I've, uh, ever, ever since I was in the hotel business and owned a hotel, I'm like, God created women just incredibly different. You can't have a front desk manager that's a male, in my opinion. We do one thing at a time. So someone will come to the front desk and I'll go, what do you want? The phone could be ringing, other people can be moving around, and I'm focused on getting him registered. Then I'll go to the next person, see what they want. Beautiful, wonderful ladies that are front desk managers that are skilled, they're kind of on the phone with one person, they're talking to this person, and they're checking someone else, and they've got the whole thing going on. God has made you guys amazing. So, uh, But I wanted to say this, ladies, I feel like somehow y'all have a more difficult time not comparing yourselves with others. And sometimes it can hinder you. I didn't even know there was such a thing as cankles. You guys ever heard of this? Of course, guys have never even considered this, but it's like that spot where your ankles don't look good when you're wearing a, a sun shoes or something. And I heard this uh, friend of mine, it was a lady saying, well, I'm just my ankles don't look right. I'm like, Rick and I never have that conversation. <laughs> the closest we would get, Rick would say, hey, you might have some soup on your coat or something like that. But that's the only comparison we would get. But what it does is it keeps you from taking action because you're focusing on self all the time. So what you need to do if you're gonna take action, which is our, our third step, in moving forward with a life of anointing and, and fulfillment is just look at who you were yesterday and say, am I better than that today? That's the way to movement and action. Ladies, you all got this one? And the ladies watching? And, uh, don't look to other people for their approval. <clears throat> this will do two things. One. It takes away your proactive ability to change if I'm waiting for someone else's approval. Secondly, it will take the locus of control of your emotions and put them with someone else. And never do that. Don't ever give up sovereignty of your internal state to someone else. So this, this is kind of... Let me, let me break it down to you. So if I came to you and I said, um, uh, my wife really made me sad today. She didn't appreciate um, you know, the beautiful uh, deer head that I put in the living room. She made me sad. She didn't look at this thing and say, wow, what a great piece. Of you guys are laughing because you know this was actual conversation that we've had at some point, right? There, there are no deer heads allowed in my dining room anymore. So, But what I'm saying in that is my wife has the ability to make me sad. Do you hear that? It's not true. Always between stimulus and response lies my ability to choose. I chose to be sad because of what she said. I chose to be angry because of what that person did. I chose to be depressed because I, I was reigning on this physical world and not on the, the world of Christ. It's always our choice. And if we eliminate that, we become a desperate people that are linked to other people's approval. And you'll never get that vine life that God is calling for because he and he alone is your approval source. So Amen, yeah. Give the Lord a hand on that one. Always looking. Don't look to other people for their approval. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be a jerk about stuff either. Like it's my job to personally offend everybody. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Don't fear change. All life is change. First of all, let me say this. We, we have to we have to grip this a little bit because change is often a difficult and guarded thing for us. We, we're, we're creatures of habit. The more I study the mind and its functions, a lot of our mind takes tasks 
and it doesn't want to use up a lot of memory, so it kind of makes habit out of tasks. Like this morning, you got up and put on your socks and shoes in the same order that you've done since you were a kid, but you don't even think about it. You don't even know that it happened because it's a little tiny program that's running. And it helps us so that we can be thinking about higher functioning thoughts while I'm putting my shoes on in the morning. Like, is the coffee ready or something like that? That's a, that's a big one for me. But these things create habit, they create pattern, and it's difficult for us to assess and change them. But all life is change. You are shedding your skin metaphorically and recreating yourself, or should be continuously. You're different than when you were in your 20s, you're different in your 30s, you're getting, you're getting better, you're getting stronger, your spiritual life is growing. All life has changed. Think of the most dramatic change there was. One day you weren't here, then you were born, and then the next day you were here. That's a dramatic change. All life has changed. It's part of action. And action is part of staying filled with the Holy Spirit, staying filled with this vine life of Christ. Before I go into our last key, let me ask you this question. And I, I, can we, you know, like if we were in a, in a room, we'd huddle up, but can we huddle up for a second? Just those of you watching, I just want to, I'm not going to ask you to tell me the answer, but if nothing changes in your life right now, do you feel you're going in the direction that God has called you to? It's not a bad thing. It's just a question. Don't shoot the messenger on this one. Is your life full of the vine life of Christ? Let me back up to this one. If you're waiting for some external circumstance to come into your life to radically change the course and the direction, you've taken the control of your life and you've given it to chance. Does that make sense? Like if, if one day Chris recognizes my incredible spiritual gifting then he'll put me on the stage and I'll be thrust into a world platform. But until that, I just have to wait for Chris to, to recognize this incredible gifting. Instead of movement and action towards the goals that God has for you. Are you full of the vine life of Christ? Now this is not, this is not sin and not sin. Does that make sense? I'm not in that, so I'm not in that spectrum. Are you sinning or are you not sinning? Are you born again or are you not born again? I'm not in that spectrum. I'm in the spectrum that says, do I feel the life of Christ, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit moving through me? Do I feel that in my, in my heart? Can I sense that? These are... These are what we call in the business key diagnostic questions for you. Do you sense need for change, but you're just not sure where to start? I would say as I'm going around more and more people, I, 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 I get this feeling, they're saying. I get this sense that something is about to happen. I get this sense of change. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit more on that, and uh, perhaps we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. But I wanted to ask you these key diagnostic questions because you and you alone can ask the profound questions of yourself that will change your life. Even without the corresponding answers, these questions are vital. Number four, key number four, I told you I'll only give you four keys. Desperation for rhema words from God. Desperation for rhema words. Now, I'm not saying that this is you following every ministry and going to every conference and you're just waiting for some external word of God for somebody to pray over you. That's beautiful when it happens, but that's, that's not the way our life is lived, chasing those things. I'm saying that there was a word that Rick had one day and said, I feel like Chris is going to be the successor. There was a word that Chris had to have from God that said, hey, I feel like I'm called here to this ministry. Those things are biblical in nature, but they're direct 
direction from God where you know that you know that the pages of the Bible leapt off and they spoke to you. And though anybody else knows you are going after something with this rhema word of God. That's what I'm talking about. I was uh, preaching somewhere the other day and I was, uh, people were asking me about different miracles that I had seen and I'm telling them about the miracles and as I was walking off the stage the Lord's like you know those are all like 20 years old I felt deflated I'm like Lord he's like these are like old trophies you have on your shelf that you keep polishing and you know uh it's time for some new miracles Dave and as I thought about them they all came with these incredible rhema words of God I don't want to be just up here polishing my trophies of yesterday and 20 years ago and telling you, God moved in my life mightily. But I want some today stories. Turn to someone and say, I want some today stories. Come on. So let's just go through this. You know, when you see the word, word, it's a funny way to say it. You guys know this. You're all super smart. When you see the word, word in the Bible, it can be one of two very different things, logos or rhema. Logos is the unchanging word of God settled forever in eternity. You can trust it. You can live your life by it. If it says don't do it, you're best not to do it. If it says do do it, you're best to do it. It is unfailable. It came right from the mouth of God. These aren't stories or allegories. This is the written word of God. Forever eternal, the logos word of God. Everybody got that straight? Rhema, on the other hand... So, for instance, with logos, you know, this is the concept, thy word is settled in heaven. Contrastingly, rhema is derived from the word to speak. It has this audible sense where I'm hearing something, and it's a direct personal disclosure to me. I've said this before, but I know when, before I came here, I got a scripture from Isaiah that said, you will rebuild ancient ruins. Things that were long desolate, you'll repair. And I'm like, Lord, what does that mean? I mean, I'd done some of that, you know, rebuilding some historic things. And then when I came to Morningstar, I thought, this is it. I'm called here to work alongside Rick to help restore this this ancient ruin at the time. And you guys have seen the slides. But that was a rhema word of God. So, for instance, in Romans, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the rhema word of God. In Matthew 4, it says, Jesus answered, it's written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that comes from the mouth of God. By each successive rhema, our lives are directed. Now, please, don't run out, don't scream, don't send me letters, but the Trinity is not the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. I, I know it sounds funny, but there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of the body, and I, you know, I'll leave Rick to clean this one up or Chris, but <laughs> yes, the Word of God is infallible. Yes, everything is it, but it doesn't replace the authorship of the Holy Spirit in your life and the, the preeminence of, of a life filled with touching the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? You can't substitute it for, you know, it's, is, is it better to read Rick's book or to know Rick and have him talk with you? Is it better to, to read the Bible or to be in touch with the creator of the Bible that even if the world was filled with books, it wouldn't contain the mind of Christ? <clears throat> so here's why I'm saying it's important that we're filled and we're not dry. These points are important because the new move of God requires a deeper commitment and consecration and the vine life of Christ. You've been sensing it. You've been watching the world go off the rails. You've been wondering how all this is going to work out. Well, I'm telling you, it involves you and I filled as last day warriors with the vine life of Christ. 
absolutely, we are not spectators. Excuse me. We're, we're here, and, and it's very important because the next movement is a movement of engaging culture. When uh, Rick and I and Chris the other day were in uh, York County, and we're in that uh, county place, and I turned around and I saw dozens of men and women that were there fighting with us in prayer, letting a, a, a government know what's important to them and standing up for their rights. The, the whole thing came to me and Jesus said, this is what it means to be light and salt, to be engaging our culture. Yeah, it got quiet in here now. You want me back up to the other one, knowing Christ or one of those? There's a reason, listen, there's no, uh, electricity doesn't flow from a socket unless it's plugged into something. One time I'm praying, I, I, I swear to you this is true, I'm praying, I'm like, I sense there was more power of God available. I was desperate, I would walk my dog and literally I would pray half the night. I'm like, God, I know there's fire to be had. I know that there's anointing, Lord, you can heal. I know it, I know it, I know it, I don't see it. I don't see it, I'm praying, God, give me this thing, give me this thing. And the Lord speaks and goes, for what? You don't do anything. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of don't. You know, it was at a time that you know, I wasn't ministering anything. He's like, what do you want my power for? Like to heal the dog or, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be totally stupid about this thing, but I am trying to say that you have to have something to plug into the wall to get the energy. If you want to feel the miraculous power of Christ, you have to be in a situation that is devoid of the ability for human effort to fix it. And you have to be the one standing in faith for a connection of God, for healing or for a word or for something. When you're in that place, then you can reach one hand to, to earth and one hand to heaven, and you can feel the lightning of God come through. Jesus is our example in this. He goes and he confronts the Pharisee. He confronts uh, the powers to be, but he never does it by losing his peace or taking on lies and deceptions. Lies and deception. Because here's the issue. We watch an angry uh, world, whether you would call it left or socialist or whatever nomenclature you would use, we watch it use weapons like lying and shouting and degrading their opponents and monopolizing uh, the conversation and doing all those things. And we, we disengage because we go, I can't use those weapons. Well, your weapons are superior. Your peace is superior to their shouting. Your prayer to take thoughts captive is more powerful than their propaganda. The Lord Jesus Christ coming through you with one word can shatter their opposing opinions. Amen. Two of you believe that. I've got a, a free uh, thing that I put out to all my KBA members. It's called asking the right questions. It's free, just write us at KBA. Just ask questions about your life, where you're going. It's info at kbabiz.com. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Man, it feels good, doesn't it? It feels good to be here and just say, Lord, we know that you're gonna do these things. Lord, we know that right now as we reach our hand to you, Lord, I believe that people are being set free from your, um, how do I wanna say it? It's like you've been marching in a little circle and now the door's open, you're gonna be marching in a different arena. I believe that people are gonna be set free from the sense of being dry. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this release. I feel like people are being set free from the sense of if my wife would just change, I'll be better. If only when I retire, then I'll be able to do this. Or if, uh, you know, whatever that external thing is, you're being set free and you're seeing that you have the ability right now. I don't care how old, how young, where your resources are, you have the ability right now 
to be the best you ever. Father, I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. We go forth because there is a dying world. Come on, somebody. We want to engage it. We want to be counted as engaging this culture and going out with you, Christ, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you.